how do you avoid uh, sort of only preaching about politics? I think you avoid it by not being partisan. All these issues are moral issues. All these issues are justice issues. And so when, you, when you're preaching on things, you're pointing to scripture as the absolute foundation and source of knowledge on these issues of justice or morality. Um, but also I think you avoid excessively talking about politics by being expositional in your preaching. Jeff Durbin, apologist, pastor, longtime debater, world champion martial artist. Jeff Durbin is a leader and defender of the Christian faith. Most people know him for his ministry, publishing podcasts and sermons regularly on their YouTube channel, but also he evangelizes to Mormons and other various cults. He is currently the leader for End Abortion Now, a ministry whose goal is to criminalize and end abortion through the church and state legislation. But most importantly, Jeff is a pastor, shepherding his flock at Apologia Church in Mesa, Arizona. In this episode, we discuss whether pineapple can go on pizza, how to prevent politics from dominating the pulpit, and some concerns that Jeff saw during the Capitol riots. All right, so I have traveled over 2,000 miles. I survived 2020. I survived a pandemic. Yep. To ask you so this, far. yes, to so ask far. you this one question. Okay. Does pineapple go on pizza? Uh, pineapple can go on pizza. I mean, it's the difference between can it and ought it to. I would say ought it. Well, I, mean, I don't know. It's totally that's a subjective. That's a thing of taste, <laughs> I guess. But uh, it's not the best. Let's say it that way. Okay, we got that. Okay. I mean, thank you. Cult, cult leaders love it. Wait, what? So does, does my view of God's law influence what I'm yeah. doing as a pastor? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, there's elements to this that we're supposed to all agree on as Christians. If we had a minute alone in a coffee shop together, none of us would have any difference on this point. Jesus is the king. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. He's the king of kings today. He's the Lord of lords today. He's the ultimate authority. He's the standard. He's on his throne, putting his enemies under his feet. 60 seconds in a coffee shop, no difference. Now, where you go in the second minute with this conversation is where the, the wheels start to fall off in some conversations in terms of, okay, what does that mean? What's it mean that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth today and that the kings of the earth are supposed to obey Jesus? What's, how do you apply that today? Well, does that have to relate to eschatology? Um, not in principle. Not in principle, because you could believe in principle all those things about the authority of Jesus Christ and him being the ultimate standard and knowledge not even being possible outside of Jesus Christ, and it could not impact you in this life and in this world because you could have an eschatological system that says, well, all this is going to hell in a handbasket, and what's the point of polishing brass on a sinking ship, which has been said a number of times by solid Christian men in this generation, men that I love and respect. And so in principle, you could be in full agreement with the post-millennial theonomist, right? In principle, and we're brothers together in this. But practically, as it starts to work out, eschatology does have an impact, yes. Uh, because you could say, well, I don't really think that we need to apply any of that today. But from my perspective, I would say that the gospel is the gospel of a kingdom. And that's missed today in evangelicalism in the West. We've lost that. It's the good news of the kingdom of the Messiah, that he is ruling and reigning now on his throne. And that meant something to Orthodox Jews. We're talking about Jews who believed the Old Testament, who had the expectation of Jesus, his coming, the Messiah's coming. They understood that there are particular promises of the Messiah's kingdom in the Old Testament that the Messiah was supposed to accomplish. All the nations coming to God, streaming up to God's mountain, Isaiah 2. Um, that he would establish justice on the earth and the coastlands would wait for his law. He wouldn't grow faint or weary until he had established justice, justice, that the law would go forth from God's people, the Torah would go forth from God's people, that salvation and re redemption would be brought to the ends of the earth. That was the expectation. And this is supposed to be good news of a kingdom. So it's not, the heart of the gospel is justification through faith, but the gospel is not just justification by faith. 
Of course, that's, that's part of the gospel. That's the gospel. But it's also good news of a kingdom. Well, what's good news about it is that Jesus is ruling and reigning now. He's bringing his salvation to the ends of the earth, and he's bringing justice to the ends of the earth, Isaiah 42. That's a promise. It's a constituent element of the Messiah's kingdom, is that his law is a constituent element of the blessings on the world. The good news for the world is that is the Messiah is going to establish justice in the earth and draw the nations to God, save people. Um, and so, yeah, it impacts because... If you believe in the good news of a kingdom, that Jesus has authority over these United States today, then that means you'll press his crown rights in every corner of life, including to the sphere of government. It's not just the sphere of government. It's also the arts. It's also the sciences. It's also medicine. It's also anything with truth, beauty, and goodness. It's all areas of life Jesus has authority over and and we want to we want to actually proclaim his excellencies in all those areas. And so, yes, four states by May of 2021, where we've been able to, through the proclamation of the gospel and the authority of Jesus Christ, point legislators to God's standards and his demand, his demand of justice for these preborn children. And we're not doing it with neutrality. That's the key thing. We're not doing it with neutrality. We're not doing it saying, yeah, you know, I'm kind of Christian on the side and, you know, that kind of influences my, my pro-lifeism, but I'm, I'm just doing this. I'm approaching this from, from a simple position of science or basic ethics, whatever that might mean in 21st century America. We are proclaiming Christ, preaching the gospel, and demanding that our legislators establish justice for the sake of these preborn children. And yes, my view of the gospel impacts is impacted or impacts all of that. My view of, of Christ's victory in the world um, motivates us being able to go out there and do that. And my view of the law of God and its abiding validity has everything to do with that. And I do believe that the kings of the earth today are, are commanded by God in Psalm 2 to obey Jesus. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So we got into a lot of uh, theonomy and how that applies. And one final question in, in that regard is, how is it that you keep balance in... Uh, preventing politics from going into the pulpit, I think you understand the sense of what I mean. Mm -hmm. Some some evangelicals, the only thing they do is talk about politics. Yeah. Some completely avoid um, politics, but or but that leads to a problem because it makes them you know does not inform the congregation that they're unaware of like what situation. They, what's their going witness on. becomes irrelevant. Their witness becomes yeah. irrelevant. So how do you keep that balance? In, it's in a great there? question. So. Uh, Culture is religion externalized, right? And so the, the culture of, of a nation will represent the worship of the gods of that nation. And so if you have a place that is fundamentally Christian, with people who have profession, professions of faith in Jesus, their worship will lead to an externalized culture that looks a certain way, mm. right? And politics is essentially dealing with moral issues. So in a culture, Politics is dealing with the, the essentially the enforcement of public morality. And so when someone says something like, you know, I just believe in Jesus, I don't do politics, I would say, so you're, you, you have no concern with morality? Because <laughs> what politics are legislating on is they're legislating on things that are law. Morality. Things that have to do with morality. What they're saying is this, but not that. They're making distinctions. They're saying, you can do this, you can't do that. We ought to do this, we ought not do that. I mean, that's what people are doing every single day in Washington, D.C., and in your legislature locally, they're saying that we have to enforce this for the purpose of public morality. This is the right thing to do. This is the wrong thing to do. We ought to be doing this for our citizens. And so when someone says, again, I don't do politics, what I would say is, well, then you're morally irrelevant. However, the perversion of that is where people essentially are Christians, but what they really are politically is partisan. And so what they are is they're partisan from the pulpit. And what I always want to avoid is being partisan from the pulpit. In other words, we shouldn't have pastors standing behind the pulpit preaching sermons on the glories of Donald Trump. I think that's idolatry. Yeah. You know, even if you know, even if you are happy about some of the things Donald Trump did and all the good things you know, that you might say this is actually something consistent with the Christian worldview, we shouldn't be putting signs up for Donald Trump outside of our church. I think that's idolatry. I think it's sinful. I think it ought not to ever be done. And we have to avoid the the typical sort of uh, and it's it. Let's just confess to it. It is there. The evangelical America ideology. You know, 
I'll give an example of this, perfect example. I think it kind of goes with your question. Um, we went to the, um, the uh, Washington what, DC. What was it, was it called rally? I don't know, the rally. The, yeah, we're the Capitol, yeah, we didn't go to the Capitol riots. <laughs> I had the no. FBI call me, by the way, just so you know, I didn't go to the Capitol. <laughs> I wasn't a part of the Capitol riots. Um, yeah, the FBI found out we were at the um, uh, in DC. It was so weird. I was uh, this is a tangent, but I'm sitting back there and uh, I get a weird number. Were you you were uh, Matt was I think we here when it happened. I get this number on my phone. I don't recognize, and I don't usually I don't usually answer phones that are not recognized numbers. And then I was just like, for some reason, like, I guess I'm going to answer this. So I picked it up and it was a guy who said, hey, I'm such and such agent with uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. I'm, in, I'm part of the uh, terrorist task force. I'm wow. aware that you were at the, uh, the Capitol during the riots. <laughs> and I was like, uh, we were there to film and provide distinctly Christian commentary on the ground. And I said, if you watch any of our live streams, you can see we were repudiating everything that was going yeah, on. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I, I actually really appreciate it is, is that after that whole fiasco that happened, you kind of gave your analysis on the whole thing. Yeah. And I think one thing that you really did point out very strongly is that there was a very uncomfortable pseudo-Christian yes. mix between Donald Trump and and um, Christ. Yes. Like, what was one of the signs? It was like, you know, yeah. Donald Trump is my president, but Jesus is my king, something like that. Yes, and there were these perverse signs of like uh, Donald Trump in the White House over his desk, like with his, his, his head in his hand and Jesus standing over him, like, you know, holding his head and a hand on his shoulder sort of a thing. And there was just sort of this blending of like Jesus Christ and Donald Trump. And some would say, well, and here's where I kind of disagree with some people is that that's Christian nationalism, but that's, you know. No, no, this, it's, it's well, strange. That, that's why that's some people looking into it from right. the left. They're, they look into it and be like, well, you see, that's Christian national. And they think um, Donald Trump is, a, is, a, is like Jesus or right. the Messiah. Right, well, it's when someone asks me, because this whole conversation of Christian nationalism came up. I had the Associated Press contact me. They wanted to do an uh, interview with me on on Christian nationalism, and I, I was like, I don't even know what that means. Yeah, like, what I does didn't it mean? Either. I'd never. What, what does it mean exactly? Uh, if it me, if you mean, are you as a Christian trying to bring this entire nation under the authority of Jesus Christ? My answer is, isn't that the Great Commission? Hmm. Yeah, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Are we trying to bring every single nation in the world under the authority of Jesus Christ? My answer to that is yes. That's kind of what the Great Commission's about. All authority, heaven and earth, make disciples, all nations, baptize them, teach them, obey. That's, of course, the goal. But the perverse thing that I saw in Washington, D.C., where that, if that's what Christian nationalism, then, then put a match on it and, and soak it in gasoline mm -hmm. because that is not biblical Christianity. That's not, that's not what we're trying to do. This is about the gospel. I want Donald Trump to know Jesus. I want our president to be submitted to Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. I want him to, I want to him, the president to be in the background and be almost non-existent. As a matter of fact, the way that this country was established because of the great covenanters and Huguenots and reformers that gave us this country, the president wasn't supposed to be the king that he is now. He wasn't supposed to be as important. There's also a problem there in terms of like, how would the law of God protect us from what we have going on in America today? it would protect us a great deal in terms of the division of powers, proper role, those sorts of things, an ultimate standard that's above the president and Congress with the, that they have to yield to. I mean, I think the greatest failure, I'm in agreement with the Covenanters on this, the greatest failure in the United States Constitution was the fact that they didn't explicitly name Jesus Christ. Hmm. Um, there were people fighting for that, and uh, unfortunately they lost, and that I think is a huge failure because if you have a general word God in your constitution, but you don't point to the true God, then, then the sky's the limit. Any, everything's up for grabs. But if you're pointing to the triune God of scripture, which many of the colonies did, they actually had in their formal documents a pointing to the triune God of scripture, they named Jesus Christ. Uh, give you one good example of this. Uh, in the 19th century, when the Christian missionaries went to Hawaii, and in 20 years, they won the Hawaiian Islands to Jesus Christ. I mean, over 90% of Hawaiian natives were professing faith in Jesus. When they made their Hawaiian constitution for the Hawaiian kingdom, they actually say in it that no law of the Hawaiian kingdom will be at variance with the laws of Jehovah God. They named, they named Jehovah God in their constitution. 
Uh, so that was that was well done, um, and that that would offer that would afford a lot of protections, theonomically speaking. When someone has a question about, is this right? Is this wrong? What ought we to do here? You have a reference point to say, well, the God of this nation is he says here, so to offer protection. But when someone says, back to your question, because this kind of, I think all kind of comes together, um, how do you avoid uh, sort of only preaching about politics? I think you avoid it by not being partisan. All these issues are moral issues. All these issues are justice issues. And so when, you, when you're preaching on things, you're pointing to scripture as the absolute foundation and source of knowledge on these issues of justice or morality. Um, but also I think you avoid excessively talking about politics by being expositional in your preaching. In other words, going through books of the Bible verse by verse. Yeah, I think the gospel can take care of politics itself in a lot of ways. If you're preaching through the Bible, if you're going verse by verse, your people are going to be fed God's standards of righteousness and justice, and they're gonna have an answer to things like, um, uh, let's just throw some out, uh, abortion. You have an answer because you're going through scripture. That's your standard. So it's a moral issue. And here's my answer because God says, when is a question about um, excessive taxation? Um, those sorts of questions come down to the Christian standard of you should not steal. You should not steal applies to you and I and our personal relationship. And it also uh, applies to the person wearing a black robe with a fancy pen. It applies to them too. You should not steal as an absolute standard above even the judicial branch or um, any other branch. Um, and so if you're preaching expositionally through scripture, you're getting to know God's word and his stipulated standards, and you'll have an answer for the political, AKA moral issues of the day.